this quiet place with you, I bow before your throne. I bear the deepest part of me to you and you alone. I keep no secrets for there is no thought you have not known. I bring my best and all the rest to you and lay them down with all my heart. I want to love you, Lord, and live my life each day to know you more. All that is in me is yours completely. I'll serve you only with all my heart. You faithfully supply my needs according to your plan. So help me, Lord, to seek your face before I seek your hand. And trust you know what's best for me when I don't understand. And follow in your obedience in every circumstance. With all my heart, I want to love you, Lord, and live my life each day to know. With all my heart, all that is in me is yours completely. I'll serve you only with all my heart. All right. I, I forgot one announcement. We will not have Tuesday night soul wedding this week because uh, it is supposed to rain and a lot of the staff are going to be up north. And my wife and I were actually going to leave to go up to the conference yesterday, but we did not. Uh, but I had already asked Brother Chim to speak. But he's not going to get to. Just kidding. So Brother Chim is going to come preach for us. Brother Chim. Th it's not too late, Pastor Myers. It's not too late. <laughs> Anyhow, please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 11. There's a handout that's going to be going out right now because we all love handouts, amen? At the bottom there, there's a coupon. No, there's no, no coupon. Coupon to live for God. Got quite a few of the verses listed on your handout there. I think there's one verse that we will turn to. I'm always thankful for the opportunity to preach. As I mentioned before, I'm thankful for the opportunity to preach, not just or not because I get to stand up here and tell you what the Bible says, but every time that God gives me an opportunity to preach, I get to study the Bible, amen? And God gets to first work in my heart, right? If God doesn't work in my heart, I don't, I'm not sure how I can relay what God wants me to relay properly. So I'm thankful for this message, again, because of what God is doing in my heart, my life. And I just want to kind of share with you uh, what God has done. John chapter 10 is our first verse on our handout, but we'll, our text verse is going to be in Matthew. The Bible says in John chapter number 10... The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I think most of us would understand that the thief represents the devil. Okay, his main objective, as the Bible says, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. He is here to steal, to violate, to kill, and to destroy our lives. Any sin that the devil holds before us and shows us all the joy and the temporary benefits of that sin, understand that after we chew and when we swallow that sin, we will have repercussions. Because he's here not to satisfy, but he's here to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life, amen, and that they might have it more abundantly. Thank God that Jesus comes to fulfill, to give life, which is a sign of prosperity, fulfillment, that we might have it more 
abundantly. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 11, which we will stay at extensively, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help me this morning. The reason why I want your help so desperately is because I know this room, this church is filled with people that are in need of you. And we're in need of you in many different ways. Some are in need of you because they're going through a storm. They're going through stresses that, unfortunately, sometimes we bring upon ourselves. We're going through trials. We're going through spiritual droughts. Some in this room have maybe neglected you for the last several months, maybe the last several years. Others are contemplating maybe not living for you anymore. Maybe they're contemplating that within the next couple of weeks, this is the last they'll come to church. I, I don't know, Lord, what is going on in our hearts, but the neat thing about it is you do, and you have the antidote, and you have the solution. And my prayer is that I can be used by you this morning. Please, I know there's a lot going on this morning with the rain and maybe lunch plans and other plans at home. But if we could reserve the next 30 minutes to give to you, to give you access to work, a great work in our heart, I pray that we would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The title of the message this morning is God's Way is Way Easier. Can I get you to say that with me, please? God's Way is Way Easier. One more time, please. God's Way is Way Easier. As I mentioned, the devil is a dirty liar. Okay? He's not just a liar. He's a dirty one. Among the most dangerous and effective of his lies is this. It is hard to do right, and it is easy to do wrong. And by the way, because of how we feed our flesh on a daily basis, this seems to be true so often. However, when you think about teenagers that watch their friends going to a party where there's dancing and drinking that is prevalent, they see them enjoying themselves and having fun, and then they think to themselves, I have chosen the wrong way in abstinence. I have chosen the wrong way in trying to stay away from that worldly situation and environment. But we understand that they've chosen the right way. You think about the former drunkard that had victory over alcohol for any certain period of time. They walk by a bar. They feel this intense desire for that cold beer, not remembering the repercussions that came with that lifestyle. They break out into a cold sweat as they walk by and they think to themselves, have I really done the right thing? Have I done the hard thing possibly by choosing a life of trying to get victory over alcohol? Because it sure seems a lot easier just to give in, just to give in. The Bible teaches us, however, that the devil's way is not the easy way. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs 13, 15, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is what? Is hard. The way of those that live in sin and by sin and for sin is hard. We must understand that. I believe very firmly this morning if there's one thought that God would allow me to drive home to his people, it would be this, that God's way is way easier. God's way is way easier. First of all, let's consider who God is. I believe oftentimes we'll come to church and we'll go to our Bibles and we'll try to live or the attempt to live the Christian life without considering how great and how big God is. I believe one of our biggest problems, one of the Charlie Chim's biggest problems is that I often turn capital G God into little G God by the way that I live by the way that I worship him, by the way that I serve him. But I'm here to remind us this morning, it doesn't matter what your view of God is, God is big, and God is able, and God is powerful, and God's way is way easier. He is the most powerful. There is none other that can equal to him or to his abilities. He is the most perfect. Listen, you and I, we can try our best to be moral. We can try our best to be holy. But when push comes to shove, at the end of the day, there's always going to be impurities in our lives. But God is perfect in him. is no blemish. We can trust in him, amen. We can look to him. He's the most compassionate. He's the most passionate. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In other words, the Bible teaches us that out of all the ways that we can show love, one to another, Jesus Christ showed the greatest form of love by giving his life for us. He's the most patient. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't consume us instantly? Listen, I try to be patient, but I fall short often. And I'm glad that with my impatience, God doesn't return to me in patience. I'm thankful that he is patient. He's the most personal. What do I mean by that? Our God is a personal God. 
When he looks at us, he doesn't see just Pacific Baptist Church. He doesn't see us corporately. He doesn't just see us by section, balcony, lower left floor, lower center floor, lower right floor, outside patio. He looks at you individually. He sees you individually. He sees you by your seat, and he knows your heart. He's a very personal God. Thank God for that. He's the most peaceful. He's the calm after the storm. He is the refuge that we need to run to in, for, in need of safety. He, the Bible says his name is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. I'm thankful that he's there to give me peace when I'm stressed out. I'm thankful he's there to calm me when the storms of life are oh so present. Thank God for that. He is the most praiseworthy. Listen, there's a lot of characters in life, in sports, and whatever, in politics sometimes that we like to praise and that we like to hail all praise to. However, there's only one that really deserves it all, and that's Jesus Christ. I get it that teenagers want to get collect baseball cards and basketball cards and put up posters in their wall, but let me, let me, God is worthy of our praise. He doesn't have to slam dunk to be worthy of our praise. He saved me. He sustains me. He provides for me, and he does the same for you. Thank God for that. He's the most pure. I think of a glass of water. Oftentimes I'll go to a restaurant, and, and now I just decide not to look very closely in the water if I want to drink it, amen. You'll start to see these little things floating around, and some people say it's from the ice. Other people say it's calcium. I just call it impure water, okay? That's what I call it. That's why you drink a Coke, amen. You get extra calories, but everything just blends in perfectly. One consistent color other than those bubbles that you got to have when you drink Coke. Because if you don't have Coke with bubbles, you're just drinking sugar water, okay? And that's not, that's besides the point. Get back to the Bible here. Salivating here, all right? But let me say something. If, 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 if God were a cup of water, which God is not a cup of water, there's nothing but purity. There's nothing floating around. You can drink it with confidence. You can go to him. He is a living water and there is no imperfection in him. Thank God for that. Everything he is, everything he does is good, and it's right. The very God that embodies all of these attributes that I just shared with you this morning, he desires for us to live life his way because he understands the makeup of Charlie Jim. He understands the makeup of you. He understands that when he created you, there's a certain way that you've got to live. You've got to live in order for you to be fulfilled. If I try to use a hammer to, to screw in a screw in the wall, I might be able to get it done with that back end of the, the hammer. I don't know what it's called. And if I got it wedged it in, you know, the big enough screw, I might be able to, to get it to work a little bit. But that wasn't what it was designed to do. That hammer was designed to drive in nails. And until that hammer is used for its intention when it was created, it's not going to be fulfilled. The same applies to us. I believe that we get lost sometimes trying to do this and trying to do that, not realizing that God didn't design us to do those things. He designed us to live for him. And you'll never be fulfilled chasing sin. You'll never be fulfilled living it on your own. Don't waste any more years. This very God, this perfect God, this passionate God, this pure God, this powerful God, he wants you to live life his way, his way. In Matthew chapter number 11, if we look at it together, we see the layout that God has given us to live life his way. First of all, verse number 28, if you can turn there, please. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28, the first word that we see is come, is come. There's a call to participate, a call to participate. The activity is in that first word, come. In other words, God requires us, if we are to experience life his way, the first action that we must perform is to come to him, is to come. The second thing we see is the audience. Who is to come? We get that we're supposed to come, but who is to perform this action? It says all. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. In other words, that invitation, the call to participate that God gives to all of us is for all of us. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you don't have a Christian pedigree. I've got good news for you. God says, come. It doesn't matter if you don't have money. God says, come. It doesn't matter if you've wasted the last 20 years of your life. God says, come. I'm glad this morning that the invitation to experience the life of God is for everybody. And it's not just for certain and select groups. Thank God for that. The call to participate, the activity is come, the audience is all. Then the announcer to me, listen, you can go to people, you can come, but if it isn't to Jesus Christ, it will not be worth it. If it isn't to Jesus Christ, you will not be fulfilled. God says, come, everybody that is heavy laden, everybody that is burdened down, 
come to me. We're asked to come to God and invite, an invite to Jesus Christ. Now, what's the award? What do we get for coming to God? I will give you rest. Amen? Amen. I will give you rest. Listen, I don't know about you, but I enjoy working, but I also enjoy resting, okay? The reason why I can work hard and I try to work hard and I can work harder, I'm sure, is because I get to rest good. I don't know about you, but if you've ever put your head down on an uncomfortable pillow, maybe at a hotel somewhere, or maybe it's your own bed, I mean, just buy another pillow for crying out loud, all right? Stop with the Big Macs and all that. Buy another pillow. Invest in your bed. And you're tossing and turning. It doesn't seem like no matter what side you flip your pillow on, how many of you guys need cold pillows like I do? Cold, firm pillow. You got to have it. Okay, this whole thing of just drowning in your pillow because it's so fluffy, do you want to die of suffocation? That's not good for you. If it's not good for a little baby, okay, to have, so it's not good for an adult, all right? I mean, come on, that's just a little lesson there to help you out, live longer. However, when you put your head down and you rest on that nice, cold, firm pillow, and your bed kind of contours to your body, memory foam preferably, but if you can't afford it, just pretend. And man, as you experience that great nights of rest, there aren't very many better feelings than that. Can I tell you something? Many people live very rough, unfulfilled lives because they never get rest. They never do. It's sin after sin and then repercussion after repercussion and then consequence after consequence and more sin and more sin. And they make more money and they seem like they're having more toys, but they don't have that fulfillment. Why? Because God is the only one that can give you that good night's sleep, that, 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 that sleep that has no guilt behind it. Right? You're not biting your teeth. You're not bitter. You're not wondering if what you did that day is going to suffer some repercussions the next day or you're going to get found out. You're going to get caught. Thank God that when you live for God, he can give you that rest. Amen. He can give you that rest. Number one, the call to participate. Come to him, everybody, and he will give us rest. Number two, the condition to be met. So there's a call to participate. God wants us to participate by coming to him. And then there's conditions to be met. The conditions to be met. First letter there is the requirement of service. The Bible says, take my yoke upon you. I looked this up a little while ago, but a yoke is a wooden beam normally used between a pair of oxen or other animals to enable them to pull together on a load. In other words, it allows them to work together to fulfill whatever job is at task. When Jesus Christ says, take my yoke upon you, he's asking you to partner with him as you live your life. <laughs> Think about that. The God that designed your life, the God that designed my life doesn't tell you to do it on your own. He says, partner with me. Partner with me. First of all, I know everything that's before us. I know exactly what we need. And also, I know how weak you are, but I also know how strong I am. I believe one of our greatest frustrations this morning is that we've been trying to carry this load of life our families, our trials, all alone. And we get frustrated when the whole time Jesus says, I'm here, I'm willing, let's yoke up, let's team up, and let's live this life the easy way. Take my yoke upon you, there's a requirement for service. In other words, God wants us to be able to live life his way, Work, his, his purpose and his work, his ministry ought to be important to us. His way of life ought to be important for us. As a Christian, that doesn't mean that you can't ever have fun. But as a Christian, the things of God should matter to you. Souls being saved should matter to you. Ministry, what goes on at Pacific Baptist Church should matter to us. Tuesday night soul winning, bus ministry, the nursery, the Sunday school classes, that new building, all the mission field. All these things should matter to us. Why? Because we're teaming up with him. We're teaming up with him. He's telling us that you want to try to carry that load of sin over there. That's not going to be very easy. And I'm not going to help you team up and, and carry that load. But if you want to help me carry this load over here, the load of the work of the ministry. And we may be tired sometimes from, from counseling with people and, and, and helping people and, and, and guiding people. But I tell you what, that's nothing compared to the burdens that you have to carry because of sin and selfishness. And the devil, yoke up with me. Carry my load with me. We'll make this work. Take my yoke upon you. This speaks of a requirement for service. This speaks of submission. This speaks of partnership with the Lord Jesus Christ. The letter B there in your notes. There's a requirement of schooling. So God doesn't just say team up with me. God wants you to learn a little bit. So what does he say? And learn of me. You know, a lot of people will just say, you know what? All you got to do is just get saved. Yeah, that's all you got to do to get to heaven. But if you want a better quality of life on earth, you want to be more useful for the Lord Jesus Christ, 
learn of me. If you're going to partner with him, he wants you to be knowledgeable. He wants you to be able to be a good partner and learn of me. What does that mean, going to church? You know, this morning in your Sunday school class, you learned something from the word of God. And if you did not come to church, you wouldn't have learned that. You know, this morning, Lord willing, you're going to learn something from the word of God. And if we didn't come to church, we wouldn't learn that. Tonight, you're gonna, if you come to church, you're going to learn something from the Word of God. And whatever it is that you've learned in Sunday school or this morning or tonight, you're able to use it and apply it in the work of God and apply it in your life and apply it in your knowledge. And you'll be that much more valuable for the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn of me. Church, Bible reading. Not only at church. Thank God for church. I go to church every time the, door, the doors are open. Literally, amen. But I can also learn from my own devotional life. You know, when you come to church, preaching is important. And I love preaching, and don't take this wrong, but that is God's message that he spoke to someone to speak to me. And God speaks to me through the message. But many will tell you there's not a greater feeling than opening up the Bible and God speaking to you directly. Oh, man, I tell you what. It's like relaying a message to someone, right? But then when they pick up the phone and you get that personal phone call and it's not being relayed to three or four different people, you feel a little bit more special. And God gave it to you specifically and God wants to give you that God wants to give you that opportunity to learn but we can't if we don't open up our Bibles Sunday school as I mentioned prayer time you say how does prayer help me to learn of God the Bible says if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of God the Bible says that we can ask God for understanding when you pray and you ask God for things God will give it to you are we giving ourselves the opportunity to learn more about him maybe that's one of the reasons that frustrates us you know every trial that I've gone to through Every burden that I've carried, I've had verses that I've learned throughout my Christian life to carry me through it. I wasn't like, oh, man, well, I don't even know this Bible is good, but, but where, what can help me? Thank God because of God allowing me as a teenager until now to position myself, to be in the Bible, to learn verses, truths from the Word of God. God brought me through trials. I believe some of us, we go through trials, but we don't know anything because we're not giving ourselves the opportunity to learn how to get through those trials. Number three, the compensation to be acquired. So there's the call to participate. We're going to be quick. The activity, come, the audience, all of us, the announcer, we're coming to God. The award, he will give us rest. The condition to be met, partnering with Jesus Christ, taking his yoke. We're going to take a yoke one way or the other. It's either the devil's yoke or God's yoke. Might as well take God's joke. And then there's a requirement of school, and let's learn about God. Let's be a little bit more educated. I remember uh, before I get to the next point, uh, I think I was at, I don't know if it was at Pastor Meyer's house or whose house it was at, but it was a bunch of kids that grew up in church, amen? And there was a Bible quiz game, trivia game. It was simple questions, you know, and they're asking, okay, name all the disciples. And I was like a Sunday school teacher. Or I was a department head at 16 years old. And I remember, oh, Charlie, and I was 16 at the time. Nick, can you name the disciples for us? Tell this guy what, what they are. And I'm like, oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, I, I couldn't name it all. And then there were other questions, you know. I mean, I'm not talking about who's the smallest man in the Bible, Peter, because the Bible says he slept on his watch. I'm not talking about that, all right? I mean, Bible, you know, uh, where in the Bible did they talk about playing tennis? Uh, Je uh, Joseph served in Pharaoh's court, okay? We're not talking about that. Real Bible questions. I remember I, I went to my bedroom or I, wherever I went, and I was like, I don't know anything. And I remember making it, by the way, I can, I can mention the 12 disciples. If you want to see them afterwards, come see me while I have Google in front of me, okay? But... I took time to study because I needed to learn more as a Christian. You know, if I'm going to be a Christian for the rest of my life, I want to learn more about it. Amen. And then number three, the compensation to be acquired. There's an undeniable offer. What is that? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. An undeniable offer from the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's why you come. Here's why you take what I have to offer. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then there's an undeserving offer response Jesus says for I am meek and lowly in heart I'm going to tie those two together you know we sometimes like to preach on the love of God and I am doing that this morning but we have to understand that by nature he's loving but he's also just we must understand that we don't have a right when we sin and we live wrong for him to just look down at us with a humble heart what we deserve is for him to put his hand of judgment upon our lives. One of the things that I love sharing with people, as I did this past Tuesday when uh, Brother Ryan and I were able to lead someone to the Lord, I always mention one of my favorite verses is Romans 5.8. 
But God commendeth his love toward us. And here's the key. In that while we were yet sinners. And I talked about, man, it's easy to love the lovable, amen? It's easy to love those that just gave you a gift card, amen? It's easy to love those that take you out to eat. It's easy to love your wife when breakfast is being served in bed, microwaved or not, to have it served in bed. It's easy to love your wife when she's massaging your feet and taking out all those little socks of particles that get stuck between your toes. Man, help me out here. It, oh, okay, okay. I told you, honey, it's not just me, and that was the evidence right there. But anyhow, it's easy to love your wife and your husband when they're doing wonderful things for you. But when they're not lovable, when they're not lovable, but Jesus Christ said he showed us his love in that while we were yet what? Sinners. While we were sinners. While we were sinning. While we had impure thoughts. While we were living for the devil. While we were angry. While we were deceitful. While we were lazy. God looks down with a meek and a lowly spirit and says, I know what you've gone through. I know the sin that you've done. But I'm giving you an undeniable offer. And it's to stop carrying your own yoke. But to partner up with my yoke and live life my way because it's way easier. Thank God. For that, the compensation to be acquired, there's that undeniable offer, there's that undeserving response. We don't deserve for Jesus Christ to be kind to us. You understand that? Many of us have used his name in vain time and time again. Many of us have slapped his hand out the way when he offered it us. And then he offered it again and we slapped it again. Not right now, Lord. And he offered again. I got to chase my career right now. And then he offered again. I'm not living, but I'm bringing my family to church. And he offered again. I'm not living life that way anymore, Lord. And he still keeps on offering it. Meek and lowly in heart. How many times do we have to slap God's hand away? He's loving. He's providing an option for us to live life his way. And then the unbeatable consequences. You know, I often thought of the word consequences having only a negative connotation to it, right? You know, you, 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 you speed on the freeway, there's a consequence, right? You, you, you do this uh, bad and there's a bad consequence. But the definition of consequences the effect, result, or outcome of something occurring earlier, okay? It is the effect, result, or outcome of something occurring earlier. In other words, the Bible says, and he shall find rest for your souls. We will get that rest, but it is going to be a consequence, the effect, the result, the outcome of something earlier. What came earlier? Come, all, come to me, all you that labor, right? take my yoke upon you. You do those things, and guess what? You get that rest. The prerequisite. You got to do those things, you will get that rest. Maybe the reason this morning that some of us are not getting rest, and we're not enjoying God, and it's a burden to live the Christian life in our estimation because we've maybe never even done it correctly, wholeheartedly. Maybe the reason is because we've not come to God wholeheartedly. We've not partnered up with the Lord Jesus Christ. And our shoulders are boggled down right now because we've been carrying our own burdens. But Jesus Christ wants to help us. Lastly, and I'm done, the conclusion to ponder. There's a call to participate, number one. There's a condition to be met. There's a compensation to be acquired, the benefits. And then there's a conclusion to ponder. Conclusion to ponder, letter A. The right way is the easy way, amen? I hope I made that clear. The right way is the easy way. And let me say this, I apologize to you on behalf of every Christian that has disappointed you. If any Christian out there is living life defeated and trying to blame it on the ministry or trying to blame it on giving to God faithfully at church or trying to blame their finances because they tithe, I'm here to tell you they're wrong. They're wrong. And sure, there are some burdens because we all have burdens on this earth. And sure, there are some trials that everybody faces that is called human. Yep, yeah, yep. However, living for God is the best way. Living for God is the easy way. And sure, there may be moments that I can't have what the flesh wants, but living for God is way easier. You know, sometimes uh, Christians live defeated and other people looking on the outside will say, look at what God allowed to happen. And I get it. God allows certain things to happen to build people. and We have no idea what God is doing. So save your judgment for yourself. However, I believe that sometimes even in my own life, because of my sin that nobody may know about, judgment comes and people blame that judgment on God. No, that judgment on my life is the result of my sin. 
That judgment upon my life is the result of me not opening up the word of God. That judgment upon my life is not because of what God is or who God is or what God wants to do in my life. It's a result of me living half-heartedly. The right way is the easy way. I encourage you, the right way is the easy way. Are you having an easy time right now? Are you having a tough time right now? I encourage you. Maybe you just need to put down this yoke and partner up with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let her be the wrong way is the hard way. The wrong way is the hard way. As I mentioned in my illustration about the teenagers that feel that they've chosen the wrong and the hard way as a result of not going to the, the parties and the clubs and living immorally and all that stuff. No, in reality, they have chosen the right way. I look at my kids and how innocent they are right now. As I mentioned, when they were born, it's like a blank sheet of paper. And as I allowed them to be uh, uh, exposed to sin and worldliness, they get more marks on their life. I'm thankful that they can hear things, even curse words to this day. Not at home, amen. But they can hear things. And they can act like they didn't, nothing just happened. You know why? They're innocent. They're pure. They can probably even, God forbid, see something very, very bad, and they wouldn't even know that it was bad. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to change over time. But you know why? Because they're innocent. They're pure. They've not been exposed. They've been guarded. They've been protected. Are you telling me that that's harder than a teenager that can't keep his eyes on the opposite gender on their face? Are you telling me that that's harder than a teenager that is addicted to drugs and, and uses their lunch money and has to steal to feed their marijuana needs or their drug needs? Are you telling me that no, the right way is the easy way. The wrong way is the hard way. If there's one thing that we can encourage our young people, and not just the young people, but our adults, our single adults, our married adults, our older adults, if there's one thing that we can encourage all of you with is that the wrong way is the hard way. The wrong way is the hard way. Being drunk may be fun for a little season, but when you're passed out and you lost your wife and you lost your husband and your kids fear you now or you lose your children and you lose your money to that horrible addiction, it is not easy. It's hard. Doing drugs and getting that short little high may be a neat experience for you to have with your buddies every once in a while, but when you find yourself going from one drug to the next drug to the next drug and needing something bigger, and then again, losing your family, losing trust, losing your spouse, losing your finances, losing your job because you missed out on work because you were on a high and you passed out somewhere, didn't even know where you were, that isn't easy, my friend. That is hard. That is hard. When you're living life immorally, maybe getting on your cell phone, looking at pornography or doing things you should not do at work with the opposite gender being a married person that may seem like there's a thrill behind it that may seem fun initially but when your mind is so impure that you can't help but have a bad thought every other minute of your life that is not easy that is hard that is hard I'm here to say this morning God's way is the easy way by the way I see a lot of faces this morning and I'm not here to condemn you but you know what I'm talking about it's enough of that going on in all of our lives. None of that is worth the short moment. I don't even want to say season. The short moment of fun. Ask the teenager that wanted to live loosely, and unfortunately her parents allow it, and then they end up touching and kissing and then getting pregnant. Is it pretty easy having a baby as a teenager? having to forfeit their opportunity to be a teenager. By the way, that's why we have the rules that we do. Get a lot of people bark at me and yell at me, uh, oh, no dating in school. I'm sorry. Okay. There's enough of that junk going on. If I have the fence over here a little bit, maybe if you were the principal, you'd have it over here. You were the pastor, you'd have it over here. But I feel like it's pretty safe over here. You know why? Because even though it's here, we're still dealing with some of it. Wouldn't be bad to get on board with the church. It's okay, we're trying to protect her. They can still get married. They can still have a wonderful family. They don't have to experience what love or real love is like at 14 years old. They can wait. They can learn some character. I'm not preaching on this. Stop saying amen. I got, I got to move on here. The right way, but oh man, I don't want to hurt Buddy Fufu. I want him to get in touch. Yeah, and he's going to get in touch with that stuff. He might get touch, in touch with his feminine side as well. Watch out for this. Let her see the Christian life. Pastor Myers is like, I probably should have said, could have said that a little nicer, amen? He's more wiser than I am, all right? Next, let her see. The Christian life is not a life of no yoke. It is a life of easy yoke. Don't mistake that, right? Sometimes we say, well, hold on here. So-and-so is going through a tough time. It's not a life of no yoke. It doesn't mean that you don't have to carry any load. It just means that our yoke is easier. 
Our yoke is easier and our burdens are lighter. Letter E, two more and I'm done. There is no better master than Jesus Christ. I taught this morning, listen, before we were saved in class, we were slaves to sin. The chains were around our wrist, around our neck, around our waist, around our ankles. But after we got saved, Jesus broke the chains and we became a servant of Jesus. But the problem with some of us is that we miss those chains, but we forget how much it hurt. We forget the marks that it left us, in some cases for life. And we go running back and we embondage ourselves again. Jesus says, I, I save you to free you, not to live that way, but to live the easy way. There is no better master than Jesus because he knows me, he loves me, he cares me, he's patient. What a wonderful God. Lastly, and I'm done, no matter what our trials and troubles, we must rejoice that our burden is lighter and our yoke easier than if we were living for the world. My challenge to you this morning, whatever path you're on, whatever decisions you've made, Jesus has an invitation to you. Take my yoke upon you. Come unto me. Take my yoke upon you. And by the way, two things will happen. You'll take his hand and you'll partner with him or you'll slap it away again. Let's all stand.